This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. I hope I've made sense of the um, two types of gearing. Again, it's not every exam, obviously, and it, but it has been a while. It's due. For if nothing else, to, uh, to, to ask you to write about gearing, it could be just one of the two, but quite likely to explain both of the two, you know, why they're important and so on. All right? So make sure you've got it. Uh, it's funny, most people can write about financial gearing. They don't always write very well. Sorry, I'm talking about other places. Yeah? They don't always write very well, but most people can talk about financial gearing. Operating gearing... Uh, a lot of people aren't, don't really know what we're talking about, you know, that's why people lose out. Sometimes it is just talking. Uh, other times, I'm still trying to get my pa pages in order, other times he does actually um, give you information about a company and asks you to come up with a sort of measure of gearing as well as discuss it. So, if you go back, if you would, to page 74-75, where I'd been discussing financial gearing. Financial gearing, 74-75. Uh, there is there a very standard way, which I think you've probably all seen, but anyway, a very standard way of measuring the level of gearing in a company. Financial gearing, remember... Uh, relates to how much debt finance you've got. All right? Hello? And there, there is a standard measure. The debt finance you've got, there's something called the gearing ratio, which is, the formula is at the bottom of page 74. It's better illustrated by numbers rather than just talk around it. But essentially... There are two ways it can be defined. I've lost my mouse. The gearing ratio, when we talk about financial gearing, um, some people write it as the first one, essentially um, debt borrowing as a... Oh. Uh, no, basically, one way of defining it is just the ratio of debt borrowing, long-term debt, to equity. I know the formula is slightly different. Uh, do remember, I did say earlier that as far as financial managers concerned, preference shares are just like debt because they're paying fixed dividends. It's just like fixed interest. Okay. So occasionally he brings in some preference. If he does, you treat it as debt. So the ratio of debt borrowing to equity, equity always is ordinary shares. Now, just so there's no doubt, I put figures to it almost immediately. It's very easy. Uh, however, there are two ways. The alternative is instead of the ratio of debt to equity, the ratio of debt to total long-term finance, equity plus debt. I say, rather than discuss around, it's better seen with figures and there's no argument. But there are two ways people define it. Virtually always, though, when the examiner asks for the gearing ratio, virtually always, he defines the way he wants it. He says gearing ratio, debt to equity. Or, he says gearing ratio, brackets, debt to debt plus equity. You understand me? They give different numbers. But some people do it one way, some people do another. Uh, if he doesn't specify, then either way would do. But virtually always when he asks gearing ratio, I've said he does actually define it. Okay? Well, to avoid any confusion, just look at example two. Um, very quick. Lavatel PLC has the following summarised statement of financial position, the balance sheet. 
This is what he does. He gives you a balance sheet in the um, exam, quite often. He says, calculate the gearing ratio of Lavatau. Hello? I've said he will define it. Either debt to equity or debt to total. You with me? Well, if I use the second definition, all it is, it's the ratio, the total debt borrowing on the balance sheet. Well, you tell me, what's the total debt borrowing on the balance sheet? Oh. On the balance sheet, what's the total long-term debt finance? Hello? Are we all on page 75? Hello? There is a very simple balance sheet there. Can you tell me, on balance sheet figures, how much debt finance is there? Thank you. 100,000. Express it as a percentage of the total long-term finance, equity plus debt. From the balance sheet, please. How much is the total equity borrowing? Yes, the total equity borrowing is 140. The debt borrowing is 100. And so if I use that second formula, the gearing ratio on that basis, I've oh, here it is, 100 divided by 240. Well, uh, uh, you can either write as, is my arithmetic right, 0.42? Oh. Yeah, I thought we'd finish a few minutes early. At this rate, we'll be here till 8 o'clock. 0.42, strictly weight ratio, that is. More commonly, it tends to write as 42%, but it doesn't matter. But it's simply... Uh, that ratio, and I think, I'm not going to write down, I think you'd agree, the more debt finance there is, the higher that ratio would be. Would you agree? You know, there's no good or bad level, I've already, we've already discussed. There's advantages to having debt finance, there are problems. So you can't say whether 42% is a good level or not. But... Clearly, if that goes up, you have more debt finance. If it goes down, you have less. Okay? I've kept saying, he always defines it. If he had defined it the other way, as debt to equity, then, of course, it would simply be 100 over 140. It would be a different figure. But as long as we're consistent, it wouldn't matter which way you measured it. Now, are we clear, please? Um, almost always... The gearing ratio is measured using balance sheet figures because usually that's the only information you've got available, all right? However, if you look at this question, and he has done this, read carefully, I've said calculate the gearing ratio using, first of all, book values, balance sheet values. But I've then asked you, and it's less common... But I've asked you to work it out using market values. Well, if we use the market values, the actual value of our debt borrowing, our equity borrowing, well, if I use the same measure, debt to uh, equity plus debt, what's the debt borrowing? Well, the debentures are 100,000 balance sheet, the market value is 95 PC. So what's the total market value, please, of my debt borrowing? Would you all agree? 95,000? Everybody? I've also told you the market value of shares is $2.20 per share. Well, it's uh, debt over debt plus equity... What's the market value, please, of our equity borrowing? Mm -hmm. 
Say again. I, don't, I, I think she's right. Be careful of two things which may seem silly, but the mistakes people make. First of all, it's $2.20 per share. The share capital, they're 10 pence shares. So if balance sheet value is 10,000, would you all agree there must be 100,000 shares? They're 220 a share. So, um, thingy there was right, Valentina. 220,000. Now, say so it may seem silly, but again, it's back to exams. When he's done this, it's very easily missed, of course, that you don't notice the 10 cent shares. Yeah? And you're in at 22,000. The other thing, in case anybody was wanting to, a lot of people say, oh, the share capital's worth 220. Oh, but hadn't we better add on the reserves? Well, think about it, that's absolute rubbish. Surely one of the reasons the market value of the shares is more than nominal is because the company's been earning money and retaining and whatever. Yeah? You know, that's one of the reasons why the shares are worth more than 10, pen, 10 cents. It's effectively included in there. You're not going to add it on again. All right? However, if he did ask you for the gearing based on market values... What is it? 95 divided by 315. Am I right here? I, this time I get 0 0.30 or 30%. Is that right? Now usually you don't have market values so you have no choice. It's just balance sheet values. Do note though, and do mention if you get the chance... Two things. First of all, I think you'd accept based on market values, would actually be more meaningful than balance sheet values. You know, I think you're aware, well, of course you're aware, that balance sheet values are dangerous at any case. You know, the balance sheet values in some sense mean nothing. Yeah? You know, the value of the company won't be, yeah? So, market values would actually be more sensible if you had it. Also, think about this. Would you not agree with me that balance, sorry, yes, balance sheet values would normally overstate the level of gearing? Not always, but normally. You see, the debt, you'd never expect the market value of the debt to be massively different than the balance sheet value. All right? But equity, surely, not always, but most companies, would you not expect the true value of equity to be higher than balance sheet value? Yeah? You'd expect the market value, therefore, normally, not always, to be higher than balance sheet value. And so given that usually market value of equity will be higher than balance sheet value, or put it the other way, balance sheet value will generally be lower. And gearing based on balance sheet values will usually, in a sense, overstate it. It'll always look higher. Yeah? The real gearing usually would be lower than it appears to be from the balance sheet. Now, I'll only mention that if you get the chance, but usually all you'll have is balance sheet. All you could do is 42%. And you can have the chat I had before about in what ways is the gearing good, in what ways is it bad. Okay? The other gearing, operating gearing, there is no standard measure. There isn't. And when he's asked it, he may give you, he has given you information from accounts showing you the fixed and variable costs and things. He's asked you to discuss the operating gearing, but there is no standard measure. And I've given you two suggested ones there at the top of page 77.
The first one, <coughs> I wouldn't ever use, to be perfectly honest, percentage change in earnings before interest and tax, or percentage change in sales, I'm almost tempted to put a line through that. The second one, though, could be useful, surely. Uh, the operating gearing, it was, look back to that example, it was all a question of how much are fixed costs, how much are variable costs. Well, although there is no standard measure, certainly the most obvious thing to look at would be the ratio of the fixed to variable. The greater the ratio is, the more the operating gearing, the more risky things are. Okay? So again, I wouldn't worry about the first. Uh, and I say, you could, in a sense, make up your own measure. There is no standard measure at all. It's just being able to explain, and I hope I've said enough. Okay?